webinar. We will just wait another minute um, while people are still logging in. Again, a very warm welcome to today's ICI webinar titled Spotlight on CLMRS Agents. Um, I, we will probably um, have a few more participants um, joining. I would like to start us off nevertheless. We have... Um, one hour to, um, as the title says, today focus on the role of um, agents um, who implement child labor monitoring and remediation systems on the ground. I guess most of the people attending this webinar are well familiar with what a child labor monitoring and remediation is and what its core functions are. These are really systems um, that are in place to, first of all, raise awareness on child labor and the harm that can cause to children, to identify cases of child labor, um, to then provide remediation support to children in child labor or at risk, and to follow up with these children to make sure that their situation has improved. So within these systems, um, the persons who, who implement um, part of these activities on the ground are sometimes referred to as child labor monitoring agents or community facilitators really take a key role. So first of all, they are the frontline communicators of these systems um, and really the primary point of contact between farmers, their children um, and the CLMRS. So when they visit farmers in their homes, um, this is typically the very first occasion on which the farmers learn about the CLMRS and its objectives. Um, then the agents carry out a monitoring interview to identify children in or at risk of child labor. So they have to manage conversations with parents and with children about a potentially sensitive topic. And then secondly, um, in most systems, they are the ones to hold awareness raising sessions um, in which they explain to the farmers why child labor is harmful to children. So very obviously, they really have a key role to the success of these systems. And while um, typically these monitors receive a standard training package, they all bring to the job um, their own uh, very personal skills and talents, and also obviously their experience, also, um, when it's um, local, locally based agents, often farmers themselves, they also bring to the job their social capital and their um, standing within the community, as well as their very personal commitment to the job. Um, and all that has um, a strong impact on the outcomes of their work, obviously. So in our um, 2021 report on CLMRS effectiveness, 
we analyzed data emerging from CLNRS um, in the cocoa sector. And one of the questions we examined was, how do different characteristics of agents um, relate to their effectiveness at identifying cases of child labor? Um, and one of, uh, well, actually there were two important observations which um, we realized merit some in-depth examination. One um, um, observation that jumped at our eyes from the data was that female agents, even though they are a small minority of all the agents working in the systems on which we had information, are uh, um, substantially more effective at identifying cases of child labor as compared to their male colleagues, according to the data. Um, and the second observation was that when agents work in the communities where they are themselves residents, um, then they were actually slightly less effective at identifying cases of child labor. So these were just two amongst other um, observations from the quantitative data. Um, but we wanted to understand those two results um, better, which is why we have embarked on some qualitative research um, where we really dig deeper into um, these, into these um, observations. And um, so we did some research work, which resulted in the publication um, of two reports, which we are presenting to you today. So on the agenda, we have, first of all, a presentation of our work on related to female CLMRS agents, it's titled Gender Dimensions in the Role of CLMRS Agents. Um, the findings will be presented by my colleague, Alice. Um, and then we will have Julie from Tony's Chocolate Only um, presenting part of the work. And we will have some time for questions and discussion on this particular topic. Second, in the second half of the webinar, we will present the results from the second study, um, which is titled Child Labor Monitoring Through Locally Based Agents where myself, I will be presenting the main findings. Then we will have some remarks related to the topic by um, Innocence um, from Beyond Beans. And again, we will have time for questions and discussion. And with that, I would like to hand the word over to my colleague, Alice. Thank you, Anna. Um, yes, could we have the next slide? Great. So hello, everyone. Um, and indeed, so following the quantitative study that Anna um, just uh, just reminded everyone so that on the effectiveness review, we wanted to dig a bit deeper into those findings through qualitative research, um, just to identify some of the social dynamics that uh, might help better understand what we observed through data. So the research questions were the following. Next slide, please. So first, why are women more effective than men at identifying child labor cases? What special qualities do they bring to the job? What advantages do women get from doing this job? Why are there so few women? And what can be done to recruit and retain more female monitors in CLMRS? So to answer these questions, uh, two studies were conducted, one in Ghana and one in Cote d'Ivoire. In Ghana, we conducted semi-structured qualitative interviews with um, 46 CLMRS agents in three ICI implemented and supported CLMRS. 
as well as focus group discussions with 74 farmers, so all with a balanced gender representation. In Côte d'Ivoire, um, the study was similar, but had a more operational approach. It focused on two cooperatives with the aim to apply recommendations that came out of the research. So the phase one consisted of focus group discussions with community members and leaders, um, and again, with a balanced representation. So that was in 2021. The phase two consisted first in applying the recommendations. Um, which included adjustments to job advertisement, recruitment and job modalities, which were piloted again in, in two cooperatives in terms of supply chain. And so Julie will take you through these adjustments and results. And so I won't say more on that point. And second, we conducted qualitative interviews and group discussions with women who had been recruited um, and in their job for over a year. So they had been recruited following these adjustments. And over a year after, we went back uh, to talk with these women and collect their feedback and experience to gather further recommendations for future recruitments. Next slide, please. Okay, so I will now highlight the main findings from these studies. So the results make a case for increasing the share of women in this role. Uh, women were found to bring valuable skills to the job, they, and they also derive great personal benefits from it. The qualitative studies brought out four main points relating to this. So first, women, so the responses to the, to the interviews and, and the discussions in the focus groups, and that was coming both from men and women um, outside and within the job, were that women excel in the role of CLMS agents. Um, and we know that they reach or exceed their objectives in terms of monthly visits, and they identify on average more cases of child labor. Second, the perception is that women have special access to children. Um, parents were found to prefer a woman to interview their child. And uh, because women are perceived as making children feel more at ease during interviews um, as well. Third, women all mentioned that the job is really important for them professionally and personally as it offers important opportunities to develop professional and personal skills, to build social capital, to gain self-confidence, um, and also acquire financial independence. And just as an example, one of the women shared that her job had made her realize that she could convey messages in her community. Um, she explained that she had always been an active member of her church and would write speeches, but then she would um, always ask a male colleague to read them out. And so she shared during those discussions that since she'd been in this job, she decided that she could, in fact, read her own speeches. Um, so it just shows that the, the job of CLMRS agent is not only positive for women professionally and financially, but um, that the positive effects uh, really trickle down into other aspects of their personal lives and ultimately to people around them. So lastly, and it's also linked to what I just said, Respondents shared that being a CLMRS agent allows them to become role models for girls and women in the communities. Another respondent, for example, shared the pride that she felt when she arrived in the community with her motorbike, knowing that young girls were looking up at her. So um, through those studies, we, we saw that women felt that the job was clearly providing them with an opportunity to break with cultural norms and demonstrate that they are professionally competent, mobile and uh, independent. Um, so it's really clear from the findings that a better gender balance in the running of the CLMS can make an important contribution to gender equality in cocoa communities in general. Um, Okay, so now let's look at obstacles, because of course um, there are uh, many obstacles for women to access uh, the job of CNMS agents. Um, and we asked respondents and participants to suggest some recommendations to overcome these obstacles, uh, which were identified by the respondents themselves. So first, the, the job offer has to be communicated in ways and through channels that reach women and encourage them to apply. We know that female farmers are highly underrepresented in cocoa cooperatives, although this is not the case in cocoa production. 
So it's really important for recruitment activities to reach beyond cooperative members. Um, there should also be clear communication at the time of recruitment on provisions during pregnancy and maternity leave. Second, the job is physically demanding and requires mobility. Traveling from one village to another and visiting farmers on the cocoa plantations can be challenging, um, especially during the rainy season and is generally easier on a motorbike. Um, and we know for a fact that few women in cocoa communities in, in both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, very few own and ride motorbikes. And stud the studies we conducted also show that many women do not initially have the confidence to learn. Third, some women find it difficult to justify the job with their partners and families. Uh, respondents said that Married women are expected to be fully available for childcare and managing the household. And in some cases, not, not uh, the majority, but in some cases, partners felt neglected and relationships suffered from the fact that uh, women acquired a new role outside of the family. Um, however, uh, through our experience in uh, implementing uh, some of these adjustments, we saw also that partners were more collaborative and supportive when they were fully informed about the job uh, and also on, on its requirements. And ultimately also when they were able to see the financial benefits for the whole family. Lastly, we found that some female agents preferred to be accompanied by men for certain visits. The main reasons cited were security concerns for female travelers on, on some routes. So these are the results in a nutshell. Uh, you can of course find out more in the, in the reports. Uh, and I now hand over to Julie who will take you through the activities that were piloted following these findings and uh, these recommendations. Great, thank you, Alice. So we've been implementing CLMRS since 2018 and seeing very male dominated teams. And we really wanted to take a more gender balanced approach to our CLMRS teams after the effectiveness review. So that's why we, we dug a little bit deeper, as Alice mentioned, to identify some of the obstacles and see how we could put in practice some of the recommendations from that study. So we wanted to have more balanced cooperative staff teams and, and challenge gender norms in a way that was going to be aware and sensitive to cultural practices and do it in a way that works for women and their families and the co-ops and the communities. So sort of slow and steady. Um, and as Alice mentioned, the, the confidence gap can be a, can hold back women from, from seeking roles in cooperatives or elected roles in communities. So we feel, figures that the more visibility women can have in key roles, the, the better. So just a bit of, of context. Um, we decided to put these recommendations into practice in the 21-22 season at two new partners that we were starting with in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, and one cooperative had been implementing a CLMRS for a couple of years, um, it's quite established cooperative. And the other one was a uh, very new, only recently fair trade certified at the time. And we took a similar approach uh, with both. And both cooperatives had a, our female head, female directors. And we saw that the, we needed to fill a gap and we aimed for that gap to be about 30% women. So in the cooperative that was already establishing, already had a CLMRS, they were moving some people around. We added a second team to implement our program. And then the newer cooperative was starting basically from scratch. So we aimed that for both cooperatives, we would end up with teams that were about a third women and 60% men. And just a bit of context on how we implement our CLMRS in terms of our uh, um, the agents, they are community facilitators, we call them. They're full-time cooperative staff. Um, they get the social benefits that come with formal employment, uh, all costs of salaries, insurance, tax, fuel, data, repairing and replacing equipment and retraining uh, is covered by the program costs that we pay to the cooperative. They're all equipped with, with motorbikes as well. That's also part of the, of the program. And we think it's a very important part because it really allows us to um, aim and realize uh, an annual visit at 100% of members. So the motorbikes is really an important part of our, us being able to achieve that level of coverage. And the agents are required to have solid uh, literacy skills as well. So here are some of the activities that we did uh, to realize the recommendations from the study. 
the job advertisements were displayed prominently in public places frequented by women, many in the markets. Uh, the, job is, the job advertisement was also disseminated by word of mouth uh, orally to the different sections via the delegate and, and um, the cooperatives. One of them had a community radio, so the job was announced there. And we were also very clear that the um, role would involve motorcycle driving lessons and driver's license, which would be financed by the project. And as mentioned, the motorcycle was, was quite key to us to ensure our, our targets and maintain our, our standard CLMRS. Uh, and we also make sure it was very clear that the flexible working hours would be available to facilitate um, home responsibilities, such as, as childcare and meal preparations, etc. So it's quite a wide communication on the role and being very clear what the expectations and the benefits would be of this role. And as a result, we recruited an extra eight uh, female CLMRS agents across the two cooperatives. So we managed to hit the 30 percent um, target that we had set, which was which was great. Next slide, please. So a couple of emerging recommendations. I'm going to split them first onto the recruitment side and then on the employment side as we are 18 months after recruitment. But first of all, in recruitment. So yeah, as mentioned, the using the available communication challenges channels to reach women is really important. Community radio, social centers, also using word of mouth is really, really key using female agents already in the role to be able to spread the word amongst their, their peers um, is really important. And also to invite male partners uh, and also fathers actually as well to be invited to join information sessions if they would like to know more about the role that their wives or daughters were applying for so they could really understand the job's requirements. Um, and that's really key. So there can be discussions in the household regarding the working hours, uh, regarding the potential impact on, on childcare and household responsibilities to really try to be as clear as possible about what this job would entail if you, come, if you, if you apply for it. So there was no, uh, nothing, no surprises. And also to make it very clear what was covered in the role and what was not covered. Uh, it's not a, a consultancy, it's really a commitment to the cooperative and to the community. And that's reflected then in, in the fair package with a, a solid employment contract and access to benefits, including, of course, clauses to protect agents uh, during pregnancy and also making sure that they would be entitled to all maternity leave benefits as well. Um, and then the communication as well, another point on that, that it's also a good opportunity to introduce or reintroduce the child labour monitoring system as well. If so, it's a bit efficient if you are going around and talking about the role. It's also a chance to talk about what the role involves and how that fits into the into the CLMRS and to start awareness raising on child labour as well. So you can make this communication outreach as effective and multifaceted as possible to be extra efficient. That's on the recruitment side. In the next slide, talking about the recommendations during the employment time. So we see that their motorcycle lessons really need to, to start soon. It's building up confidence if you're not used to riding a motorcycle can, can take a bit of time. So it's good to start that as soon as possible after recruitment has taken place. Uh, and of course, all costs are covered by the, the project to um, do your lessons, apply for your, um, uh, apply for your license as well. Uh, we have learned that uh, nine to three um, working day is best suited for the staff, for the cooperatives. And that's not just, of course, for, for the women that's offered to all, to the entire team to take that flexible hour approach. And everyone is, is given equal access to this uh, flexible hour setup. A supportive team environment is, is really key and, and fostering a collaborative team spirit we've seen has been, has been very important in having a successful gender balanced team. The, the male staff are very supportive to their female colleagues. They offer to accompany them to, to distant farm visits if they have any fear or any concern about security or distance or time or, or darkness, etc. And the, the team together coordinate and plan this during the weekly meetings and then can, can pair up in, into duos as needed. And the co-op and the team, all of them feel very proud of how they are a balanced team and want to be an example to others that this is possible. So having a supportive team that works well together and feels proud of, the, of, their, of their collective endeavor is, is really key. And also the maternity recover. Um, we now have a community facilitator, so an, an agent who is now on maternity leave, just been on her paid maternity leave as she has full social security as part of her role with the CNPS, the National Security, National Social Insurance Fund in, in Cote d'Ivoire. 
the paid leave in Cote d'Ivoire is, is three months. Uh, you stop 1.5 months before um, your due date and you have 1.5 months after. And she worked, therefore, until she was seven and a half months pregnant. And after five months of pregnancy, all of her tasks were divided amongst the team, which again shows the collaborative and supportive nature of the team is key because they were happy, of course, to do this for her and with her. Uh, and then the cooperative has helped to help her to secure some childcare for her return, um, where she'll be, she, she can build up after the birth, after the 1.5 months of maternity leave have elapsed. They've helped her to find um, childcare and Nunu has been, has been sorted and uh, she can build back up her hours uh, as she wishes. But um, the maternity cover access is, is really important. And finally, yes, yeah, sensitizing members and normalizing female Salem RS agents is also very important. Uh, we have a community facilitator uh, of the year and we'll at each AGM. And last year, one of these two cooperatives that uh, was one of the female uh, agents, the female community facilitators. And not only was that very well deserved, of course, she met all the criteria in, in terms of meeting targets and quality of data, et cetera, but it also the cooperative was very happy that it helped to show how visibly they value women in the team and how they can do that to the broader membership at such a public event as the AGM and really to normalize the fact that they have this, this gender balanced team in place. And next slide, please. So the next phase is really already happening. Um, we have started data collection this week at two new cooperatives, so two more, and have taken these learnings really on board. And collectively, all of these standards are practice and practices are now mainstreamed into our CLMRS approach. Any new cooperative that we start with will, will, will take this approach. And for hiring any new staff at existing cooperatives, we'll also take this approach as well in both Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. So this is our, our approach now. It's, it's mainstreamed across uh, everything that we do. And we see a couple of key aspects to that. And first of all is accounting for a longer project startup. So a longer lead in time to recruitment is now our standard practice with plenty of time to do a solid outreach on the recruitment, plenty of time to, to do the hiring, to do the training, motorcycle lessons, et cetera. So it's a sl slightly slower trajectory and slower startup than we've had before, but we feel that doing it right takes time. So for this cooperative that we're, these two that we're just starting now in, in July, starting with data, the community sensitization around the role had began in March and April, recruitment was in May, training was in June, and now they're starting the role in July. So it takes a bit more time, but uh, it's, it's a good foundation to start with. Uh, second of all, the involvement of, of partners and, and fathers to take that up a level, not only during the recruitment phase, but also during the first uh, six months uh, of, of uh, employment. This is now standard practice. So if there's any issues, rather than sort of troubleshooting them in an ad hoc way, there's a structured meeting, a structured forum for, for staff and their partners or parents to discuss and for the cooperatives to help find solutions with them that work for the entire family. So that partner outreach is, is really now embedded into our approach. Um, setting targets, um, we set the target this time for these two new cooperatives to try to aim for 50% um, women. We just about hit it in one and slightly under in the other, but we're pretty happy that we now have almost 50, 50% 50 male female teams in our newest partner cooperatives and that's now our standard is to try to aim for 50 50 where feasible where it makes sense but hopefully as many places as possible and finally we need to document the effectiveness and so far we're seeing very well functioning teams at the two that have been um that started one and a half years ago we see very effective um, period of data collection case identification and follow-up Anecdotally, we see very happy cooperatives with this. Um, the supervisors of the CLMRSs have observed that the, the follow-up in particular with a lot with more women is, uh, is working very well as there's a lot of engagement between children and women in a very warm way. Um, that children open up and don't hesitate perhaps to, to speak and to talk and to share as much as they might uh, if they're being interviewed by a man that they don't know, but with a woman they do feel there's a more motherly and maternal um, aspect to it, which, which, which uh, Alice had mentioned in the, from the recommendations in the study, and we're seeing that in, in practice anecdotally as well. But we need to work, a bit, uh, work with ICI to dig a bit deeper 
and we identify what are the key factors of a gender balanced team that do really maximize impact. But uh, happy to answer any questions that there may be on, on this approach. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Alice and Julie for this super interesting presentation and um, especially, sorry, spats are switching back, um, for these practical insights um, into how better um, a gender balance can be achieved um, and uh, lessons on what has worked in the case of these um, pilot cooperatives in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire. For more details, um, I invite you to uh, read the full report, which is um, available on our website as of today. I will share the link um, to the document in a follow-up email to this webinar. Um, we are a bit tight with time. I would um, suggest that um, we do a Q&A session at the end um, of the webinar um, in which you can then address questions to Julie or to Alice um, as well as um, questions to the second study um, which I will be presenting now. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, um, from our CLMRS data, we saw that um, it does make a difference whether um, monitoring agents actually visit households in their own community or outside of their own community. Um, so that was something we really wanted to understand better why this might be the case. Um, and uh, how that situation between agents and farmers potentially changes when the agent is him or herself a, a local community member um, and what that could imply for good practice in implementing CLMRS. So we have commissioned a qualitative um, study um, to look into the subject, which has examine the following research question. So how does a personal relationship between agent and the farming family affect, first of all, the farmer's openness to talk about child labor, um, then also the interaction between the agent and the children in particular? How does it affect um, the awareness raising? Um, also, how easy or difficult is it for agents to collect good quality and complete data from the family? And then a little bit more broadly, how does it affect the social relations and dynamics within the community uh, when agents who are, who are themselves community members, sorry, um, take on this special role. So to examine these questions, we used qualitative interview data, um, interviews with locally based monitoring agents and farmers. Those data were collected in May last year in three regions of Ghana in the context of ICI implemented or supported CLMRS. So these data were collected and analyzed by a team of researchers at the University of Science and Technology um, in Kumasi, Ghana. Um, and I take this opportunity also um, to say thank you very much to the team of researchers who did an excellent um, job digging into some of those um, really um, partly sensitive questions. Um, so in total, we collected data from 58 farmers, around one of them were women, um, and all of them had previously received a monitoring visit under a CLMRS. Um, and we interviewed 27 agents, again, one third of them approximately were women, whereby we gave preference to agents who had visited both farmers 
um, they knew personally and farmers they did not know personally before they took on the role of a CLMRS agent. So the questions um, to farmers and agents were really designed to understand those implications when farmers and agents have some kind of a personal relationship independent of the CLMRS. And um, this could be just that they are neighbors or live within the same community. Um, it could be because they are friends or even relatives. Um, or in some cases also simply because they are members of the same um, cooperative. So what did we find? Um, first of all, we wanted to hear from the agent's perspective, um, how does that personal relationship affect their interactions during the monitoring visits? Um, so agents told us that when they know farmers personally, the interaction is generally speaking easier. They are um, typically welcomed warmly. They feel also um, comfortable and safe. Um, on the other hand, some mentioned um, that um, some questions actually feel a bit awkward to ask when you know um, that farmer personally, um, and notably um, questions related to children's work engagement. So that was in some cases a weird situation to ask your neighbor um, about that, your neighbor or your friend or even your relative. Um, some agents also mentioned that farmers don't necessarily take them seriously because they feel, well, my neighbor is coming over for a visit and actually the farmer wanted to have a chat about general things um, rather than having to go through this very structured interview. On the other hand, in situations when agents and farmers did no, not know each other personally, um, an important experience that was shared actually by a number of agents was that um, farmers are sometimes very unwilling to open up um, because they were suspicious or even um, feared criminal investigation related to um, child labor. Then um, they also said that farmers perceived some of the questions um, in the interview as too intrusive, too personal. Um, and uh, some agents even mentioned that they felt unsafe and um, feared harm from the farmers, um, especially when they did discover a case of child labor um, in those situations where they were not... Um, when they had no previous personal relationship to the family. So um, for us, it was really interesting to hear that this awareness of child labor being illegal um, and this fear of agents coming with um, a law enforcement mission um, was mentioned by really a, a number of agents. <clears throat> and um, we realized that it's really something that agents need to be well trained to be able to respond to appropriately. And then we wanted to know in particular, how does the personal relationship with the family affect agents' interaction with children? Um, agents told us that when they know the family, farmers tend to give um, consent more easily to the agent um, taking the child to the site and interviewing the child directly. And they also mentioned that the children themselves are more willing to answer questions because they know the person. Um, whereas in situations when the agent came as a stranger, um, the interaction with the children uh, was complicated because, well, not only the parents had certain reservations to um, the agent sitting down um, for, an, for a child interview um, in a quiet corner, but also 
children felt intimidated um, and not at ease. Um, they were very shy or even sometimes afraid to talk to that stranger. Um, so for me, uh, I think this is a consideration um, that's really relevant, not only because we are interested in collecting good quality data from the children, um, but also because we care about the children's well-being in that interview situation. Um, next, we wanted to know how the awareness raising was different, um, depending on whether there was a personal relationship. Um, so overall, we got really um, quite um, encouraging feedback from the agents about the awareness raising they carry out. Um, they um, told us that generally farmers listen with a lot of interest and attention, and that was irrespective um, of the personal relationship they had with the farmers. And some agents also reported that they observed themselves that farmers changed behavior um, following awareness raising sessions, which again was very reassuring. Um, now, besides those more interpersonal aspects um, on which our um, data collection was focused, the agents themselves brought up some logistical considerations actually, um, which were really important for them. So they said that working in their own communities felt um, on the one hand safer for them and it was less time consuming. Um, so when they visit farmers outside of their own communities, um, that could sometimes be very challenging to locate farmers' houses um, and also especially their farms. Um, and that was just very time consuming. And not go into much further detail about those very practical considerations, because we will hear in a minute um, some more firsthand insights um, on this from Innocence um, at uh, Beyond Beans, um, who will speak a bit more to those logistical, practical aspects. Now let's turn to the farmer's perspective. Um, so we started off by asking some general questions first, um, which captured their perception and understanding of the CLMRS. Um, so most of the feedback we got was that um, farmers were indeed familiar with what a CLMRS, what, what the CLMRS um, is all about, how it works and what its objectives are. Um, and they also explicitly said that they support um, the objectives um, generally. Um, however, some farmers actually also shared a concern that their children's work was needed um, to get the farm work done um, and that it was difficult to substitute their children. And um, so they were they were a bit worried um, about uh, those agents coming who want to prevent them um, to actually um, imply their children in uh, certain work areas. But um, yeah, I should highlight this was something we heard from a few farmers, um, but uh, shouldn't be neglected. Mm. And one more aspect that came out and that I find very important uh, was that farmers uh, stated they were oftentimes bored by the awareness raising sessions because the content was very repetitive. And also, um, they were overall wary of frequent visits by different agents to um, collect data from them on various cocoa related issues. So um, that was a general feedback, um, not only relating to CLMRS visits, but um, to um, yeah, all types of um, data collection exercises that are done um, in the context of 
efforts to make um, cocoa production more sustainable. So certification um, and uh, CLMRS and all in sum is perceived as taking a lot of time um, by the farmers. One farmer, um, uh, one, one farmers uh, put, put that into, into the quote, um, the cocoa trees, trees themselves are even tired of the constant visits and talking. Um, I found that um, really uh, quite intriguing. And I think it's something um, to keep in mind as we plan data collection um, related to our sustainability efforts in the sector. We have to be conscious of farmers' time investment in those exercises. Um, then we wanted to know specifically from farmers how the personal relationship with an agent affected their interaction. So overall, farmers said they have a high level of trust in the agents generally, but indeed a few farmers also admitted that they were suspicious of criminal investigation around child labor um, when um, an agent um, came for a first visit and they didn't know the person. Um, otherwise, broadly, farmers confirmed what we had already heard from the agent's side. Um, but the last point here I would like to mention, nevertheless, it, um, according to the farmers also, um, if they had a personal relationship with the agents outside of the CLMRS, they, they said that that was not in any way negatively affected when the agents assumed this new role. Um, so we didn't hear about here um, about any alienation or mistrust coming up um, when uh, someone within the community all of a sudden started talking openly about child labor um, with the farming families. So again, um, that is really reassuring for CLMRS models that depend very much on locally based agents. Um, so to summarize the findings, um, when farmers and agents know each other personally, um, farmers are generally perceived as more accessible, less suspicious, and more willing to talk about um, children's work engagement. Um, they also give more easily consent for child interviews. The agents themselves feel more comfortable and safe. Logistics are easier. Um, however, in some cases, um, interviews feel a bit awkward on both sides when um, agent and farmer know each other. And more generally, um, some important takeaways uh, for us as we design, CL design CLMRS, um, the systems are, and its objectives are mostly appreciated um, by the farmers, but they do complain about too many visits um, they're receiving overall. Um, and also, uh, there seems to be really a high level of awareness about the legal prohibition of child labor amongst the farmers that were included in this, um, in this data collection. And again, that's something um, to keep in mind. And there are a few, obviously, very practical recommendations that emerge um, from what we learned um, in this from these data. So, um, first of all, we conclude that the CLMRS must always be communicated in a way to prevent that fear of criminal investigation on the side of farmers. So, stakeholders need to be actively informed that these systems take a supportive um, rather than um, a punitive approach. Um, so those monitoring visits should in ideally be preceded with an information um, campaign about the CLMRS so that farmers will have heard about um, the, the system and they are shortly to receive a visit, um, how that visit um, is going to um, going to be structured. Um, the farmers should also be informed in advance that a child interview will be part of that visit 
um, but that the agents will take child safeguarding measures. Um, and last but not least, um, the agents on their side um, need to be trained to deal with possible unwelcoming attitudes on the sides of farmers and uh, to be able to respond to those potential fears um, around um, um, criminal investigation on the side of farmers. Again, I invite you to uh, read the full report, which goes more into detail about those findings, which um, will be available on our website shortly. Um, also, we're working on the translation of this, port, this report into French, um, will be available over the course of the next week. And I also warmly invite you to share those two reports within your networks. Now, I would like to hand the word um, to Innocence um, from Beyond Beans, um, who would uh, give us a bit more of those first-hand insights into um, why, um, from the perspective of a CLMRS um, implementer, um, there are reasons to, um, to recruit uh, agents uh, full-time or part-time with um, implications on um, how many um, um, farmers outside of their own social networks those agents will be covering. In a sense, um, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so Beyond Beans has been implementing uh, Silamaris for more than five years. And um, for last year, we started with um, engaging community facilitators, around 162 of them um, as food agents for this um, assignment. But last year, we switched from um, about 162 community facilitators to who were part-time to about 28 full-time uh, food agents. And um, in terms of logistics wise, it is more costly to switch to the full-time food agents because of course, it, once you are adding more communities to them, you need to give them motorbikes and um, put them on a salary, give them all the benefits that comes from being employed. Um, in any formal setting. So costly, yes. But then in terms of um, coverage, identifying the cases, uh, we realized after one year that the full-time food agents were more effective in terms of the number of visits per week they were doing. Um, also in terms of identifying the cases, uh, following up, and all that, they were more effective. Um, one reason we realized was the commitment that comes with being employed in a former settings. Yes, the full-time staff, because they were given contracts and also at the end of the year, they know that they will have to go through performance appraisal and they have targets to meet. They showed uh, more commitment to the work compared to when we had them um, community facilitated, where they, some of them see it as a voluntary work or maybe they are just helping. So there is no sense of responsibility because um, the person feel like you are just giving me a token. So I have to get other work to do to support myself and my family. So maybe at my own convenience, I can go and collect your data for you. But uh, with the full-time staff, yes, they know it's my job. I have to go out and um, do the work every day. And um, I'm also going to be supervised to ensure that that work is done. And if I don't do my work well, at the end of the year, there's going to be performance appraisal. Somebody's going to make sure that uh, I do my work well, and I don't also want to lose my work. So we 
found out there's a huge commitment coming from the food agents who were engaged full time. And also one thing we realized in the community facilitators were that we had a lot of uh, need to replace phones. I don't know why, but we always had reports of missing phones or maybe the phone is damaged, we need to replace it. Uh, they were not really taking ownership of the work and taking full responsibility because it's like a voluntary work, I'm just helping. But with the former engagement of full-time staff, they've also been oriented um, from our HR department on some of the things they need to also understand uh, for being part of the young beings um, in terms of taking care of company property, uh, how to conduct yourself and any um, responsibility that expected from all beyond beings employees. So we have seen a very huge improvement in terms of uh, even managing our logistics, as well as um, pushing the team to achieve their targets. And also in terms of data quality, yes, there's been a huge um, improvement in terms of data quality because now uh, the full-time agents know that, yes, it's my work. At the end of the day, I would be held responsible if I don't produce quality work. So they are taking full responsibility of not just visiting farmers and collecting data, but also to ensure that the data they are collecting is of high quality. Um, for us, also in terms of workload management, it is easier managing uh, maybe 28, 14, compared to maybe having to chase 162, 14 uh, community facilitators to get their job done. So for workload management has also been easier, um, even though the food full time staff have been assigned more communities because aside their own communities, they have also been assigned additional communities, which is not, uh, which they might not be familiar with, but the commitment that comes from being engaged full time has also demonstrated that they are able to achieve more even with new communities compared to um, assigning community facilitators to one single community where they belong to. Um, if you look at comparing um, the occupation of farmers um, in the communities of the food agents and also in communities they are not familiar with, yes, they've been positive and negative side of it. Uh, the positive side is that um, mostly in our context in Ghana, we have to rely on um, purchasing clerks, those who work with the LBCs. Um, they are normally the first point of call to the farmers. So if you don't know the farmers, it means that you have to rely on this purchasing clerks to identify the farmers. So if you are moving to a new community where you don't know the farmers directly and the, these purchasing clerks are also not cooperative, it means you are going to find it difficult to even identify the farmers in the first place. And there are also instances whereby the farmer or the PC, which we call it, might be having issues with the farmer and will not even want to lead you to the farmer. So that also becomes difficult in terms of organization um, compared to maybe you being in the community and you know almost all the farmers in your community. But then in terms of same organization, um, the team also experienced that in your own community, when you organize, uh, you visit the farmers at the household level, you do awareness sessions. So when you invite them for community awareness sessions, they don't really show interest because it's like you are just coming to repeat the same thing you did at the household level. So why should I be there? Um, so what has been happening is that there are times we, Swap, maybe swap officers, maybe officer from another community can visit another community for community awareness sessions because farmers show interest when a new person is coming, probably the person will be saying something new, different from what they have been hearing all the time. So that had also been an approach we have adopted to ensure that yes, if farmers get tired of seeing same face every day, same story, um, can we have officers move from another community? Uh, during community awareness sessions to help their colleagues to get the work done. So that has also been very helpful. And also 
in terms of the credibility of the data being collected, um, when officers are working in their communities, um, they know the household members, they know lots of information about farmers. So that also gives an opportunity for them to probe uh, when issues are not clear, because it's very interesting to know that there are times farmers want to record more household members, probably thinking that, oh, if you don't explain the civil marriage process to them very well, some have an um, assumption that there might be some inputs given to farmers. So maybe if I have more household members, I might be giving more of these items. So if the food agent knows these household members, then they can do more probing to ensure that issues are clarified and also to get credible data. Yes, it has also got its negative side because farmers also sometimes are not taking them serious because um, this is, you are my father's friend. You are this young boy who just grew up in this community. Um, you are always coming to me to interview me at the end of the day. They also expect that once you interview them and um, they are supposed to receive some items because they see uh, maybe other household members receiving remediation items. So if you are interviewing me every day, asking me about my household and uh, about my children and administering um, questionnaire to me on this assessment and all that. And at the end of the day, I'm not getting anything from you. Why should I make time for you again? Your next visit. So that had also been challenging. Um, mm -hmm. because it's like the same story. Yes. I'm, uh -huh. I'm really sorry to um, interrupt you. Um, we are running out of time. Thank you very much for those Great. insights. So I take it that actually some of the experience um, you just talked about are very much in line with uh, what we found in our qualitative um, data. However, um, there are also some really important um, logistical and well efficiency and also uh, data quality aspects um, that you brought in that are complementary to um, those considerations of um, yeah, interpersonal aspects um, on which our study focused. So that was really um, very valuable to get that global picture um, from, from your side on um, the various implications of um, those employment, um, well, uh, recruitment uh, modalities within within a CLMRS. So working with very local farmers who would cover only farmers, uh, sorry, local agents who would cover only farmers within their own community as compared to agents who uh, work full-time and who will cover um, a wider set of communities. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Um, for your insights. Um, even though we're already five minutes behind time, I would nevertheless like to give um, the opportunity to the audience um, to ask questions to any of the speakers. Um, if you would like to ask a question, um, you can uh, raise your hand um, in the reactions um, a uh, set of options. Um, there is a button for raise hand. So I invite everyone to ask any questions and I'll give it some five extra minutes. Otherwise, you can also unmute yourself if you cannot find the raise hand button in case you have any question to ask. So I can see no question for the moment. In which case, um, I would like to um, thank all the speakers um, very much um, for, for your presentations and um, 
again, I would like to invite um, everyone to have a look at the full reports, which go into further detail on the topics presented here today. Um, and uh, the links, as I said, will be shared in a follow-up email um, and along with the slides. Um, please do also not hesitate to get in touch um, if you have any comments or questions uh, related to these topics um, with the ICI team, um, learning at cocoinitiative.org. Um, and thank you all very much indeed for your attention and have a very good rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Anna, for organizing the webinar. And goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.